letter, huh? Yeah, I think I heard something about that. So, you know about the letter? Hmm, maybe I don't. I'm not sure. Ah, which is it, man? Oh, uh, and if I may ask, are you friends of Kaine? You could say that. Ah, I've heard the rumors. Here to hunt shades, are you? Indeed. Our aim is to defeat every last one. Every... Every last one? Everyone? 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 Oh, boy! Vice! Beware! This man is a shade. Damn it! It's a trap! They figured as much. Okay, still a thing. They've been possessed somehow. Keep your guard up. Others are surely lurking nearby. You guys sure are taking your goddamn time. A thousand apologies. We were distracted by the local welcoming party. Want some help? A carnival of murder? I love it! Yeah! <laughs> Kaine! The villagers are possessed! But not all of them. Some are still human, so be careful! There's a flurry of shades in a tight space here. Oh. I blame you for all of this. Alright, let's continue to get to Kaine. Exactly. Get out of here! No way! I'm not going to abandon my own sister! Kanye, what's going on? Don't be fooled by this lady. She's a shade! Sister is one of them now. I don't care what she is. She's my sister, and I love her. Yeah, I definitely remember how dumb this bit was. Stop it! Don't hurt my sister! Your sister's gone, bro. Sorry. Like I say, the, the area is a bit of a weird place because on the one hand, it seems some people really are living in a terrible oh, situation. These people are behaving as if we are the villains. Kaine! Kill them! Kill them now! No! You've got to stop this! We're trying to save you from the shades! Please! You have to stop! Emil! We need to get out of here! Kaine! Kaine, get up! Hurry! Oh, the little vixen has finally run out of steam! Is it my turn now? Are you sure about that sunshine? Goddamn. Villagers are under attack over there. <laughs> Let's 
lot of strength capsules here. Oh God, help us! Damn it, Kaine! You gotta get up! Emil, watch Kaine! I'll go clean up over there. All right. Gonna switch to Dragoon Lance for a bit. What could those black swirls be? It's all over. This village is history. This beast a shade as well. That thing sucked up the villagers. No! If we keep this up, we're gonna kill them all! We can't let that happen! Okay, let's do it. Alright, let's get this done. Damn it! We beat the hell out of that thing! How can it still move? Its combined powers are beyond even my greatest suspicion. Just another reminder that this is normal difficulty. <laughs> Quote unquote normal. Come on! Help me take it out! I'm on it! It couldn't even attack, man. Right, mutations found in subcutaneous. I've seen this one before. Emil, Emil, wait! Emil, he's gone. His instincts have taken hold. The ultimate weapon is being deployed! Ah, oh, fuck! This ain't good, Sunshine! Kid literally turns into sin.
So it feels like a condensed version of those scenes, right? I'm pretty sure it's the longest scene that played out there. Uncontrollable magic. So I guess it's time to, to read some of Emile's story. I have to protect the people I love. That was my only thought as I unleashed a magic powerful enough to destroy not only the Shade, but everyone else as well. All of them. So many innocent lives. Destroy. Eviscerate. Crush. Kill. These are the dark impulses that overwrite all other thoughts. As a being that was created to be a magical weapon, these are my instincts. Or maybe it's better to call them our instincts. Emile's Dream Rampage A klaxon sounds from deep within the bowels of the laboratory. Thick metal shutters drop down, sealing off the room with a series of dull metal thuds. Abort the experiment! Number 6 is out of control! Everyone get out of here now! Get out of here! The researcher's words abruptly cut off as a massive hand materializes out of the gloom and lifts him high into the air. The researcher begins to scream. He screams and screams, the sound echoing off the walls of the laboratory, until the hand squeezes down, coating the room in a deep crimson hue. The rest of his colleagues stand in silence, mouths open, unable to process what they have just seen. Then a female scientist takes a step back and lets fly with a heartbreaking wail. But this is a terrible mistake, for the sound of her cry suddenly brings forth a monster in all of its terrible glory. Its body is a bloated corpse, its head a grinning skull. And it is massive, many times the size of a human. The head lolls from side to side as it tromps about the room on all fours, bringing to mind the wild maneuverings of some wretched, starving beast. This creature, this thing, is experimental weapon number six, also known as Hallower. No! Oh no! Please stop! Oh God, save me! Save me! I don't want to die! One by one, the maddened cries of the researchers are silenced. If number six understands their petitions, it pays them no heed, instead continuing its rampage of destruction and slaughter with a focus that borders on obsession. After an eternity, the screaming stops. The alarms fall silent. And only then does the creature make a sound, howling out with an unfathomable roar that echoes up and down the empty halls of the blood-soaked laboratory. It's a sound that curses those who are dared bring such evil into the world, and yet one that also seems to be pleading for help. Two sets of footsteps echo in an otherwise silent corridor in the first level of the laboratory. One belongs to a young boy, his eyes blindfolded and his hands restrained. The other belongs to a severe man in a long white coat. The man drags the boy along by means of a long chain attached to a set of shackles on his wrists. Rubble is scattered here and there across the floor of the corridor making the journey an exceedingly difficult one for a boy who cannot see. Um, excuse me? Could you please walk a bit slower, sir? I'm not used to being blindfolded, and... Rather than stopping, the man only increases his pace, causing the boy to stumble in an attempt to keep up. This last humiliation proves too much, and the boy finds himself unable to arrest his fall. Without the ability to brace himself, he topples to the floor, smashing his head on a pile of debris and causing a trickle of blood to worm its way down his pale, frightened face. Agonized by the pain, the boy inadvertently opens his eyes, causing the falling drops of blood to emit a strange, crackling sound before transforming into tiny white rocks. Close your damn eyes, roars the man. Y yes sir, stammers the boy as he slams his lids shut. 
He hadn't realized the blindfold had slipped off during the fall, but now he keeps his eyes squeezed shut so tightly the sparkles appear against the black of his vision. The boy is Emil, also known as Number Seven. He is a magical weapon whose eyes are capable of turning to stone anything that falls under their gaze. Don't look at me, barks the man. Never look at me. I'm sorry, sir. I'm looking at the ground now, so if you just hand me the blo- Instead of waiting for him to finish, the man extends one foot and presses Emil's face to the floor with a heavy black boot. S sir stop! You're hurting me! I told you to keep your eyes and your mouth shut, so do it! The man knows this boy, this weapon, could wipe him out with a single glance, and yet subduing him in this way gives him a sense of relief. After making certain the boy is sufficiently cowed, the man leans down, retrieves the blindfold, and knots it tightly around the boy's quivering head. Right then, on your feet, let's move. Emil staggers to his feet, trying to ignore the red liquid oozing down his face. The blood doesn't matter. The pain doesn't matter. All that matters is finishing the job they are set out for him to do. The second level of the laboratory is in even worse shape than the first. The environs are scattered with rubble and rock, making the thought of a decent foothold laughable. When the man's eyes linger on a section of the rubble stained a deep red, he has a sudden image of warm, gooey brownies slathered in strawberry sauce. His stomach lurches at the thought, but when he attempts to avert his eyes, they land on the remains of a human being rendered into what could only be described as paste. The man blinks. His mind goes strangely blank before attempting to determine exactly how many humans had to be sacrificed to create the scattered piles of flesh around him. After a moment, his thoughts simply cease altogether as if his mind realizes that trying to put such a thing into form is folly. You, you can go the rest of the way on your own, says the man in a voice much weaker than he wishes it to be. I mean, what, I mean, what does it matter? You're not even human. You're a monster. With this, the man spins around and dashes back down the hall. A helpless Emil simply listens as the footsteps of his erstwhile captor fade into the distance. Emil finds himself alone in a room with a stench of death and blood. For a moment, he considers opening his eyes, but the thought of the horrors that await him quickly squash his plan. Instead, he stands still and listens intently. Eventually, a far-off sound reaches his ears. That's the howl I heard before. Emil resumes walking, using the sound of the distant voice to guide him. Almost as if it were calling him home. By the time Emil reaches the third level, he is moving on memory as much as sound. His hands and face are covered in fresh wounds from numerous falls, but every time he thinks about giving up, his mind returns to... his sister. We studied together. We ate cookies together. We cried together. We laughed together. And sometimes I was the only one who got yelled at. That's why I was never lonely. Our being together allowed me to stay strong. For Emil, his sister was all he had to live for. So holding that feeling close to his heart, he presses on, one slow step after the other. Finally, Emil finds himself drawing close to a certain experimental chamber in the deepest part of the laboratory. The howl is very close now, and as he touches the switch that controls the door, he thinks about his mission. Number six is the ultimate weapon. She is his sister. And he must turn her to stone. The door slowly opens, revealing the massive interior of the experimentation chamber. After a few steps, Emil removes his blindfold and slowly opens his eyes. His sister lurks before him, but she looks nothing like the girl he once knew. Instead, he sees a savage beast crawling on all fours through the shredded remains of researchers. As the thing that had been his sister stops and tilts its head in Emil's direction, he focuses his gaze on it. A series of soft crunching sounds emerge from the creature as his magic does its terrible work. 
first the fingers, then the hands, arms, legs, head. What little colour the beast once possessed fades to a dull, ashen grey. And yet, somehow, it summons what strength remains and pulls itself towards a meal, one slow, lumbering effort at a time. Wailing, the massive monstrosity closes in. Is she worried about me? Or is she coming to kill me? Emil feels prepared to accept either outcome. After all, this was his older sister, the person he loved more than anyone else in the world. Halua, I... The moment Emil speaks, number six comes to a sudden halt. Silence descends on the chamber as the siblings stare at each other. I'm sorry, Halua, but everyone says you're too powerful. They say it's too dangerous unless I seal you away. I'm so sorry. As Emil watches her body begin to turn to stone once more, number six simply waits in utter, perfect silence. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The moment number six's petrification is complete, her memories flood into Emile's mind. The two of them huddling together in the cold, all alone in the world, with no one to protect them. All she wanted was to save her little brother. It was, it was that little brother who, in a sense, saved her. The moment the petrification is complete, Emile sinks to his knees. A frozen sister and a little brother racked with sin. Alone in this cold cage, the two of them weep in a single, silent voice. It was our combined power that destroyed the Airy. Whole existences, entire lives, even their memories. We took it all. We took everything. My sweet, gentle sister turned into a monster. And the same thing will happen to me, now that I have her power. If my instincts as a weapon win out and destroy me in the process, if that power ends up hurting someone I love, I... For you, we'd all be dead. We owe you. But, but I. It's all right. <laughs> really? Don't look back. There we go. There's a sacrifice key fragment. Once again. We had best be off. Yeah. So, there it is, my friends. That is Emil's portion of the story. I mean, we knew that he had a very, very tragic story already, but seeing the story play out and what he's been going through, and, you know, for him, I guess, what's especially tragic about him I think is is also the time span that all of this has been happening I mean Emil has been alive for longer than any of us can ever imagine being alive and he's had to just go through such incredible hardship and again much like Kaine 
all of his all of his hardship and all of the things he's had to go through they're just they're as a result of something that he didn't choose and that he had no control over and so just having to to see that story in that way was just was again really tragic just like Kaine's and it's amazing the way that this tragedy has ended up bringing them together and obviously what Emil loved most in the world was his older sister and of course now in Kaine he's found himself an older sister something that he's been waiting for for an eternity basically and so you can see why he's so attached to Kaine and why he doesn't want to let her go at all costs and it's also why he's willing to to destroy everything in order to save the people that he loves he cares deeply for for near anyway but you know the special relationship here is between him and Kaine and you're seeing what he's willing to do and the way his instinct kicks in when it concerns someone that he cares as deeply about as Kaine because for for people like Emil and Kaine that go through what they've gone through even if they can find one person to love and that loves them back and that cares about them that's that's everything to them and I guess for both of them they they really need each other and Emil especially with his you know the loss of his older sister he needs Kaine so badly to to have a reason to live and to have a reason to to not be miserable for every single second of his of his existence that when it comes to protecting her or if she's in any danger you're seeing his instinct kick in and what he's willing to do to save the people that he cares about so that was really powerful stuff once again and again it's it's the same thing as Kaine it's one of these things where I don't want to criticize it because their stories are truly very interesting and tragic and, and well written like the the dialogue like the story sections are really well written for those guys but presentation wise I'm still like I, just, I see this stuff and I'm just like man I, I wish it wasn't presented in this way but you know I get it and I'm still overall just happy that we get to get these expansions on the story of two very important and very um, very deep and tragic characters so I'm going to wrap up this session here and we'll be back with more soon we have uh, I think what do we have left we have loyal Cerberus and we have the law of robotics left I believe so we'll be able to get those in the next session and once I get those two and we see what other, other extra story tidbits we might be getting then I'll have a side quest session where we'll get to do the major side quests of the second part of the game and hopefully also collect some weapons and have enough money to, to buy the ones that we're still missing. So we'll hopefully get that percentage close to 100 within the next few hours. If there's one good thing so far is that because it's on normal and I already know what I'm doing, it's you can blaze through the, the second half pretty quickly because it's largely the same and the new bits, I mean, if you add Kaine and Emil's written story, uh, that's maybe like an hour, hour and 15 minutes. And then the other extras are maybe like 10 minutes worth, 15 minutes worth. So it's about an hour and a half, I'd say, of new content for the second half. And the rest of it, you've been able to pretty much blaze through. So in terms of just like it dragging on and taking up a lot of your time, it's not, it's not really a big deal in that sense because you can get through quickly. If this had taken me like six hours to get to this point, then I'd be like, you know, I'd be frustrated at how much I've had to repeat stuff and how much it's felt like padding. But because the game's letting you get through the second the second playthrough of the second half pretty quickly, it's not something I really need to complain about, I think. So, so there we go. I'll be back with more soon and we will, con we will complete these fragments and get some more insight, hopefully, into Emil Kaine and the wider story. So thank you all for watching. I'll see you soon. Take care.